Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I will ask especially two people about this. And I want you to uh, ask questions as well. Um, we've got an hour for this whole uh, discussion and uh, we will have a microphone in somewhere there uh, which you can use whenever you feel like it. Um, for, uh, especially for questions, not so much comments but rather questions and not so much uh, comments disguised as questions but actually questions. Um, to my left is uh, Francesca Bria, who is the, okay, let me take out my notes so I get it correctly, um, Chief Technology and Digital Innovation Officer at the City of Barcelona and also uh, the EU Coordinator for the Decent uh, Project on Direct Democracy and Digital Currency. Uh, Francesca is advising governments and companies around the world on internet and innovation policies. And to my far left, uh, I should have put you the other way around. Left and far left, no? Let, let's see. Uh, to my far left is uh, Christian Rickards, the Berlin State Secretary for Digitization at the Senate uh, Department for Economy, uh, Senatsverwaltung für uh, Wirtschaft, Energie und Betriebe. Um, the former executive board of Wikimedia and also former vice president corporate, corporate uh, communications at the Bertelsmann Foundation. Uh, and also in charge of the, and here we start the buzzwords, uh, smart city strategy of Berlin. Now uh, we will talk about that and how to frame that a bit differently uh, in a minute. Um, so maybe uh, let's start with that a bit. Um, now you've been uh, in office for about 100 days, I think. Um, and uh, now you're in charge of this smart th city thing and so on. And what does uh, Berlin actually do to be smart and what makes Berlin smart? All right, a lot of questions. Yes, I'm, I'm, I started office December 9th, to be really precise. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm permanent secretary um, at the at the Senate for Economics, um, Energy, and, and um, Public Enterprises, I would say. I've never, I've never looked up the official, the official English translation. Um, and yes, digitalization is an important part of it because, um, as you all know, digitalization goes, goes through all the economic spheres. Um, so part of my job is actually to look at, at digitalization, um, to, to start a digital strategy dialogue here in, in Berlin and do this together with other stakeholders in the Senate and to be really precise, smart city is something which is located at the Senatskanzlei. Um, so we have, to, we have to find a good, a good party do at this, at this, at this point. Um, if, we, if we look at Barcelona at the moment, uh, Barcelona used to be a smart city, if I recall correctly, um, and is not really a smart city anymore. Does that mean it's a stupid city? What, what is, is Barcelona now? Right, so I think our job is to get rid of the buzzword immediately, so that's what we're going to do. Um, so I've been, yeah, um, I'm also kind of new uh, in office actually, I've been nominated by our mayor Ada Colau last June um, to be the digital commissioner, meaning I'm in charge of defining the digital strategy, uh, information and technology policy and aligning different departments of a city hall to um, define the future of, of, of a, a city that's technologically but also that can serve the people. And uh, the main reason why they picked um, the only Italian in a Catalan government, which is myself, and they created the new role that didn't exist before. So I'm now sitting in the government, while before the chief technology and innovation officer in Barcelona was a technical role, so he would lead the technology company of the city, but he wasn't part of the government. And while I'm, I'm also a woman, which is, I think, a very important thing in, a, in an industry and a sector that's very much male-dominated, uh, the reason uh, why I'm there was to completely redefine what a smart city is and how we see that in Barcelona. And I think this has a lot to do with having a political conversation about what a smart city is and how this should align with the policy of the city and in particular how citizens um, should be at the core of shaping the digital and technology agenda of the city which 
which means also rethinking technologies for the people and not just for a purpose of some kind of um, you know, economic planning or some corporate agenda. So uh, I don't know if you're all uh, familiar with the situation in Barcelona, but I think it's, it's good to remind a little bit uh, the novelty or the innovation that we're having in the government in Barcelona. So our mayor um, comes from uh, popular movements. Um, she, used, she used to be uh, an activist fighting um, against house eviction. Uh, so she used to be part of a, of a big coalition uh, in Barcelona that was uh, fighting uh, this uh, very criminal law that was evicting uh, many, many people in Barcelona didn't have a house. Uh, she was elected into government after a long uh, wave of mobilization, which is um, named like the Indignados movement or the 15M movement in Barcelona, which basically represents a big uh, social mobilization against austerity policy and against the corruption that uh, there was in the, in the political um, elite, I would say. And so she is, uh, we are a radical new experiment, a very new government where the majority of the people in power now in government are not professional politicians. So she's uh, coming from the, um, the citizen movement. Uh, many people in charge in the government are like that, like citizens that are in the institution to change things. Me, myself, I'm not a professional politician. So basically, uh, just to um, rethink that before they say the experts, I mean, if you, if you, if you put it like that, uh, you also have to know, uh, see the novelty into the fact that we are actually, as citizens, representative citizens in the institution and try to rethink the way that policy happens. So why all this uh, um, introduction is before, because um, I think the, the important thing about redefining the smart city agenda has been uh, really rethinking government. So rethinking how government works, rethinking the participation of citizens into the policy making process, and then thinking technology much more as a tool to implement the policies of the government and not basically a technology driven policy where the government then ends up solving the problems of the technology instead of, uh, instead of basically solving citizen problems. So we are very much now uh, aligning the technology to what citizen needs and, and, and start from there instead of starting from the technology first. And this is a big change. I mean, it sounds, it sounds like a small thing, but it's actually a very big change. And so the main difference, I would frame it this way, there is no... Um, digital revolution without a democratic revolution first, which means you really have to start what, from the citizens, what they need. And the other thing is um, you cannot go with the technology first. So although it is really important to think about infrastructure, connectivity, sensor and data, you cannot start with that. You cannot start rolling out that. You have to start from what, what the city needs. And this is exactly what we're doing. And how does that look a bit more concretely? Like, how would you actually get to know what citizens need and what do you do with that? Yeah. Well, it's a very good question. I mean, first of all, um, our plan and um, moving away, I don't think we reject the idea of the smart city. If for the smart city, mean, uh, we mean a technological city. We actually want to use technology to improve the, 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 the city. Um, I think um, what we are talking about in our plan, which is the Barcelona Digital City Plan, we talk about towards technological sovereignty, which is a concept that we're really pushing forward to uh, understand uh, um, this question of um, popular sovereignty. So what we mean by that is not just the state sovereignty, where you know the state just take decision on behalf of the citizens uh, through a representative process that may be corrupted or not, but it's really experimenting ways by which uh, citizens through participation and civic engagement can really be part of indicating the way where, where, where the city is going. So this is a very practical aspect from uh, some very radical participatory processes that we're running, uh, which involve a hybrid of online participation, uh, digital democracy participation with an open source uh, platform that we built, and offline participation with citizen assemblies and consultation. Uh, we had more than 40,000 citizens that made proposals and ideas and participated into the shaping of, of the digital strategy. Uh, and of, of, of many 
key policies of the cities from urban planning to culture to mobility um, to uh, participatory budgeting. So we have many different things that we're doing through this participatory uh, process where, where, where citizens are, are involved. And it also means um, Basically, uh, it, has, it has a very practical approach of um, thinking, for instance, how do we get uh, the citizens to know how we're spending the budget? No? And this is a part of transparency agenda that's very much also at the core of how can citizens be more participating into this is, first of all, they need to know what government does. So this is not obvious to citizens because governments are pretty opaque. Sometimes, you know, and this is, I mean, we're talking about citizens, but also, for instance, this crowd, I mean, these stakeholders that are here that made Republica great, I think you should be the main people that should tell Christian what to do with the digital strategy. I mean, meaning uh, we do not only mean citizens that are affected by specific policy, uh, we also mean, you know, people that make technology, build technology, make innovation happen, have the talent and should be part of this process. In order to know what's happening, we need to be open. And so we need to, you know, explain how we're spending our budget, explain how procurement work. So this is a very unsexy word, procurement, almost like taxation that you will debate in the next panel. But it's very important because a lot of what government does is spending citizen money to implement a policy. And there is uh, a way that you can make procurement much closer to people like you in this audience and this is what we're doing in Barcelona like putting clauses in procurement contracts where we mandate that there is sustainability that there is labor standards that there is gender standards that there is innovation standards so that smaller companies that have the capacity to help the government can run the, these big contracts so that the smart city doesn't only become a tool for the big corporations that have the ability to understand how government contracts work and then to run infrastructure, large-scale infrastructure, to run it. But in a way, through procurement and through making this kind of regulation clear and transparent, we can make possible for smaller companies that have, you know, free software, open hardware, open data, I mean, all the stuff that you're doing here, to come and work with the city to help us building a different smart city. So these are just some of the, of the ways in which we're actually implementing this um, participatory approach to the smart city. And a great moment to remind all of you, if you want to uh, ask a question, you can just raise your hand and then someone with a microphone will come to you. Um, Christian, if we look at the smart city strategy of Berlin that was written by the previous government, um, the 40 pages mainly uh, contain uh, links to, to technology and IT co companies, and if you look for uh, actual links to uh, democratic ways of, of people deciding on it, uh, you, you don't really find a lot of that. Um, now, in the uh, Koalitionsvertrag, in the, in the coalition contract, I guess, um, the coalition said that you want an update of that strategy. Can you say a bit about uh, what that actually means? Um, yeah, we, 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 are, we, are, we are just starting this process, I have, to, I have to say. The current situation in Berlin is, is, is actually, when, 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 when I entered office, it was for me like a puzzle. We have certain certain things in place. We have we have we have um, a paper on a on a digital strategy. We have the smart city strategy, which is in the introduction not too bad because it it is unbuzzing the buzzword smart city a bit because it's as well talking about what actually Berlin needs because we are talking about a city which is growing rapidly. So we have to focus on issues like mobility, energy, and actually need technology to, to improve certain, certain areas, not for the sake of, of, of technology. Um, um, so, so the goal is now to, to, bring this, to bring this together when we talk about digitalization, when we talk about smart city, and, and find a good way to, to develop a midterm strategy um, actually, for, 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 the, for the next years, and as you said, this is this is what we what we agreed in the coalition agreement that we are that we are going to do this, that we are going to do this on a participatory way. So we want to want to talk about this. We we want to discuss how to how to involve people in this and how to how to integrate 
the projects which are already labeled as smart city, which are, which are actually going on in the city. There's lots of there's lots of thing going on um, with all different stakeholders um, tr trying to find very 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 exciting new ways in mobility or in how to create my my, my local space um, differently. We have network smart city network, so. Our task is now actually to bring this to bring this in a in a in a, in a good way together, and this is this is what we now what we now started to discuss. Actually, it's not that I'm that I can sit here now with a with a with a long strategy paper, uh, which is already finished, which uh, actually wouldn't 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 be possible because, as I said, we we we, we want to do this in a dialogue way. And now you're working for a city which is especially poor, I'd say, like money-wise. Um, and with, with all of these um, innovations coming to the smart city, um, there's always the big question of, of who pays for it. Um, well, maybe, maybe to Barcelona. Who <laughs> <laughs> Barcelona is paying question. for it. <laughs> Um, no, I think it's a g great question. I mean, first of all, because it allows us to um, also open up a little bit what uh, usually is the technological debate about, um, you know, smart city, which, I mean, in a crowd like this one, it would be maybe uh, more about, um, you know, concerns over privacy, over information self-determination, over surveillance, like saying, you know, the smart city can look like a big panopticon where you are monitoring citizens, you're aggregating this data, the data get used intensively by few corporations, but the concern would be mainly about privacy and surveillance. I think there is another very important part and the debate that we need to have, which is about the democratization of the data intensive economy. And that's where um, I think not only we have to think about who is paying for the smart city, but what kind of economic models and models of the future, which is also about the future of work, because it, it all, I mean, the, the impact that these digital technologies are having on our life will, will determine the future of the economy and the future of work and start, you know, asking more and more questions about what is happening with the, for instance, digital platforms that today dominate the market, uh, which is very concentrated and sometimes look like a big oligarch. I mean, the digital economy is very concentrated. And as cities, what we can do to enable different economic models. So different economic models, for instance, where data is not used as a commodity, but data is used as a public resource, as a common good, acknowledging that data belong to the citizens and it's, you know, it should be protected with ethics and, 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 uh, and, and all of that. But also, what is this um, more mutualistic, cooperative, collaborative economic model that we can put in place? Uh, so in Barcelona, for instance, and this we open up... Um, and I'll get to who's paying for it, because I know the question is also broader, involves uh, um, public-private uh, financing and all these different schemes. Uh, but I think there is, a, there is a, something to say about, for instance, in Barcelona we have had, and it's in the paper, so everybody probably saw it, a uh, few problems with platforms like Airbnb. I mean, Uber is actually banned in, uh, in Spain for the moment, so we didn't have issues, but immediately, I mean, tra taxi drivers are striking all the time that they hear the word Uber. And, I mean, the question uh, with Airbnb for us is very clear. I mean, Barcelona is a government that's trying to implement really... Um, progressive uh, social housing policies, so to uh, increase the number of social housing, make it housing affordable. We are struggling a lot uh, to control the price of housing, the price of rent, which is going up very much. I think Berlin has a similar problem. And clearly these platforms like Airbnb uh, are having an impact which uh, affects this kind of policies very much. And, uh, and, and, and I mean, they're taking out a lot of uh, residential apartments uh, into short-term rentals. Uh, we have problems because many of these corporations don't pay taxes locally. Uh, we have issues because um, transparency of algorithms and, you know, this is not there. And so it's very hard for government to regulate something that you don't know. So I think it's actually very urgent to have a, um, a conversation about what data-intensive economies we can uh, put forward for the future, but also respecting uh, labor standards, I mean, putting people not in kind of precarized situation and making sure that we're using technology and data as a common good. 
not only as something to be extracted by few corporations. And actually, there was the, the first page of The Economist of this, of this week that reminding us, which is talking about the new resource, the new extractivism. It's not anymore about raw material, it's about data. And there are only few corporations that can extract this data and then through artificial intelligence investment, mine this data and use it to improve the world. So we're going to rely on very few companies, none of which is based in Europe. And so it is a problem for us that can do this. So I think as cities, we can put forward alternatives. And then finally, I think on infrastructure and who can fund this. I mean, clearly you need the private sector on board. I mean, you need to collaborate with companies and you need to, to make a strategy. I think the important thing for cities is that you have a clear public return. So, you know, if there is investment and if public companies, if private companies are investing and are doing their, their activities, you have to make sure that there is a, a public return for the, for the city and their citizens, which is paying taxes, of course, and that, that there is not disruptive models that really disrupt um, citizen lives, like in the case of Airbnb, for instance, where, where there is an issue. And um, on technology infrastructure, for instance, Barcelona is owning its own fiber network. Like we are, uh, we have the property of fiber. Uh, we have laid out over 300 kilometers of fiber. Uh, the city is very sensorized. We have open sensor network with open standards. I mean, the platform for open, um, open uh, sensor urban platform of Barcelona can be reused by Berlin and by other cities. It's open protocols, it's open standards. Uh, we own the fiber and we are creating a data platform that's based on open source, on open standards and its API are very well documented. I think this is a way to go for cities as well, which is about how can you manage uh, urban technology infrastructure in a different way so that the city retains some of the control. And, and, and maybe maybe to say to one one or two words about Berlin. It's it's I, I don't see it anymore that that Berlin is not the city of innovation and as well not 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 the city on investments. If you see this at the moment, Berlin is is outgrowing um, Germany by economic growth. Every every twenty twenty hours there, there's a startup founded here in in in, in Berlin. Um, half of the venture capital, which is which is spent in, in in Germany, is invested here in Berlin. Innovations, I don't know, using using IT technology is, I think, 12 percent points higher than in whole Germany. You have all the conferences, you have the you, you have the university. So. Um, Many, 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 many players want to want to invest in Berlin and want to want to want to create or or help help developing the city in a smart, intelligent way further. So there are many people starting projects in the city, um, all different all different scales. Okay, now we've got different questions. Where's the microphone? I can't see the microphone. Ah, here. Uh, okay, so I've got one here and one over there. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate, um, in particular, the presentation by uh, Barcelona, Francesca, and laying out your approach, democracy leads technology, and making reference to this very practical tool of participatory budgeting. There's a, a very concrete way of doing that, which is through crowdsourcing, that different alternative projects are being presented, and then this is made the decision-making process for allocating resources. Um, my question is, how far are you willing to actually walk down this road? It has risks involved because a small group can dominate and minorities may not be adequately reflected, but at the same time, it would be a way to get out of just standard budgeting where you basically continue just what has been done before with little changes up and down. You can do it directly. Just directly, and okay. Um, I think you, you need to, to, to experiment with different, with different models. I mean, first of all, I want to go back to what I said before. Um, really, we are running, I mean, our main innovation in Barcelona is happening in how we are changing government itself. I mean, uh, thinking that just what you said, how far you're willing to go. I mean, we are um, 
I mean, the, the, the coalition governing Barcelona is really coming from citizen movements. It's a very different way of thinking about government, where citizen participation is the core and the main value of what we do. And this is not just for technology, it's for the key policies that we're running. If it's affordable housing, if it's a sustainable mobility, if it's energy transition, if it's, uh, you know, urban planning. I mean, for instance, the main participation process was run, I mean, on the government agenda, as I said before, but the other one is on urban planning. So Barcelona as a project is called Superblocks, which is very, um, actually a very innovative urban planning process where we are restricting traffic in different areas of town, creating blocks where cars cannot enter. And this is also for, I mean, CO2 emission, to control pollution, to create more pedestrian roads and, and green spaces and all of that. It's radically changing the city. So we have done that, in, it was implemented through a very large scale participatory processes where one part was budgeting. So one part was about putting out budget and get communities to choose and prioritize the way to spend the budget. But other parts were just discussing, you know, how it should be done, how it should be implemented, where it should happen. I mean, you have many different things that you can discuss. I mean, money and participatory budget is just a part of that. Um, so um, I think, you know, in terms of where you are willing to far you're willing to go, I mean, we are going pretty far in a way of involving the population into this. And the participatory approaches are not just online, where you see, oh, there is only a minority uh, of the population participating. I mean, we are finding very different ways to involve in the citizens, through assemblies, through consultation, getting out in the street, I mean, go going into the neighborhood level. Some of the participatory processes happen at neighborhood level, where you really go to people that they wouldn't usually participate participate in the process. So, um, I mean, this, of course, within the uh, policy program for which we've been elected. So, of course, there is still a top-down approach, which is about defining the lines of the policies. That is the reason why we, we are there. So you always have that kind of balance. Uh, but I do think that the participatory um, also budgeting processes that we're running are very successful because also citizens, I mean, feel not only they're contributing ideas and, 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 um, and uh, you know, up, or like giving some um, comments to some policies, but they're also contributing where the budget is allocated and then they can track and monitor how projects are implemented. So, you know, it's, it's enriching, I think, the democratic process. Okay, I've got another one here and then in the back and then the third one here. Hi. Um, I was wondering how you define the limits of smart city, especially since you brought up the superblocks concept. So when you say smart city, is that a technological thing for you or is it a general urban planning livability thing? And I'd like to direct this question to both Barcelona and Berlin. Um, and secondarily, how do you publicize these efforts? Because I think I've literally heard more about Barcelona's efforts in this area than anything from Berlin, and I live in Berlin. So how do you make sure that it's, it gets publicized and how do you get people involved? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> it's, no, it's, 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 it's part of the debate we are, we are, we are, we are, we are now doing. We have, a, we, have, we have smart city defined in this strategy paper from 2015, really, 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 there is a definition I can't, I can't recall now, now precisely, but what we, what, 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 what we were, what we are agreeing on that we are looking into this and actually, actually asking is is this the definition from the definition and from the projects which are which are which are outlined there? So what we what we agreed in the coalition is to start a to start a process there. Um, the, the the part about publicizing things in Berlin is is something something where I'm still learning. We are we are working many in in, in many ways in silos. Yeah. On a, on, a, on a ground level in the, in, the, in the certain districts of Berlin, but as well in the, in the um, different houses of the Senate, um, and trying to find, because this is something you have to do, talking about digital, talking about smart city, trying to, trying to find ways coming out of the silos. It starts with data, it, it, it goes further with information. We, we, we do have a platform where you can participate in certain processes, but no, not all processes are documented there. Not all processes are, um, are handled there in a similar way. So to ask ourselves actually how to, how to make this um, 
better at that at that place. So from from, from a Berlin perspective, I can say um, it's on the agenda, and we are we are we are looking into that. Um, yeah, I think um, I mean. There are contexts where uh, the, the, the term smart city keeps uh, being used because um, basically there is just a market that's created around it and you know you have a lot of conferences that cross smart city. Actually Barcelona still hosts one of the biggest uh, of the smart city uh, expo that is going to happen in November. Um, and that's the reason why you continue to use this wording. I mean, we all know that the smart city was branded by big technology firms. I mean, um, Cisco, IBM, Siemens, and so on, that had a strategy that was very much technology-led, yes? And so um, the, the definition of smart city was, I mean, about big... Um, um, urban redevelopment plans where technology was a big part of it and you have uh, proprietary operating systems that run you know, different urban processes. Now, I think that we are at a point where uh, connectivity, data, sensor, and AI is pretty um, ubiquitous. So the city is instrumented with all of this infrastructure and this technology. And so it's very hard to disentangle what you do, for instance, in your energy strategy or what you do in your urban or mobility policy or how you're thinking about, you know, uh, water management or waste management without thinking about technology. And that's where I think it's a problem where we are not able to link the technology with exactly how we are running our infrastructure and our public services. The technology is a part of it. So the conversation shouldn't just be focused on the technology. It should be focused about what kind of system uh, do we want, for instance, about you know, energy. Uh, what, what is our energy system? Who is running the energy network? What is the business model? Uh, how, how are we providing the services to the citizens? How, what is the management of it? Yes? And technology is a part of this. So if you forget technology, then you end up in a place where the big technology firms are the ones setting the, the strategy and not the city anymore. So I think that um, technology can become, uh, I mean, as, as I was saying before, for instance, uh, running the technology infrastructure in a specific way, making sure that you have a data strategy by which, you know, ownership of data is guaranteed, that you have ethics, that you use encryption, uh, but not for the rights of the citizens, that you use the data to enhance the public services. I mean, all of this can really improve the way you run, um, you run your, uh, your policies. And so basically, I think uh, there cannot be a lot of what we do now is about data in Barcelona. It's really about redefining who owns the data. Are, are the citizens in charge? I mean, the citizens basically own all this data. Do they know for what the data is used for and how we can use the data to really improve decision-making processes and to really improve public services? And be, and be sure that you know, this strategy is shared. Because I think this is one of the core issues of the digital economy will be around this um, not democratization over data. So when we talk about ownership of data um, and we look at public data owned, well, or processed by administrations, I think one of the big challenges is that uh, a lot of people working in the administration think that the data they work with is their data, right? Um, so, Christian, I think that goes to you. Um, do you see a lot of challenges with that in Berlin with actually still trying to uh, convince the, the administration to, to open up? Yeah, I, I, I would say that's, that's, that's the, biggest, the biggest part of this whole thing. We, 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 do have, we do have open data here in, in Berlin. We have an open data platform. I think we have 1,200 data sets on it, which, 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 is, which is not, I don't know, looking at the data potential of Berlin and um, what, you, what you could think when you would, what you could do and think about about data is not is not is not a lot, um, and yes, you do have technological problems. You do have data silos. You don't have a have a have a common common technical open data strategy. But the, the, the major thing is 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 a culture like you described it um, to make it normal to think how to how to actually make data usable, yeah, and publish data, make it available, um, and not to protect it. Yeah. A, 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 big, a big issue with this is, of course, you had, a, you, you had, a, you had, a, you had some years in, in public administration um, 
where, where, where the people working there were, were, were limited and limited and limited, so public administration got smaller and smaller, so you haven't many... So when you when you look at many processes, we are we are we are we are we are still discussing how to make the process work itself and and not to extend a certain a certain process, which is in the head of many many people. Something when you talk about open data, I have to do something extra. I have to take care. I I, I don't have to take care that somebody is getting a certain license or that 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 I, I run a certain process. I have to do something additional, and actually. Um, Talking about the value behind this, not 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 just as a public good, but for the administration itself, is is, is, is certainly a big big thing we have to we have to do. And I think I think we are we are we are not on a, on such a bad way. We just introduced um, an e-government law in, in in Berlin, which is which is rather good, which which incorporated open open data. And um, what we what we started in the first hundred days is actually discuss. Uh, the major fields of um, open data for Berlin to actually get it into into a law and discussing this means as well to talk about processes to talk about culture and how to actually implement this in in, in Berlin because it's not just not just a legal framework you you, you, you need talking talking about open data there you, you got to run a bit to, to the corner over there <laughs> yeah um, and then over here yeah awesome uh, thank you all very much very informative i wondered if you could talk a little bit about current institutions and in cities across the world do they have the tools at their disposal to be able to create new offices or on the human resource level for for data protection both Barcelona and, and Berlin are, I think, special in some the city culture. But if this is any city, a second tier city in a random country, using the strategies that we're talking about now, do city councils, um, do state institutions that oversee city councils, do you think the institutions currently have the capacity to absorb the oversight for smart cities, or do we need to reconceptualize the way that also? protections built into institutions to ensure that even if the worst people were to get hold of this system, that it would still be safe to individuals? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, you know, with the new uh, data protection directive, uh, for instance, in Barcelona, we are already, you know, starting a process of making sure that we do um, impact assessment uh, with all the critical infrastructure that we run and you know we do have competent people inside the administration but also you have to understand I mean uh, cities really work as an ecosystem most of the time. So if you do not have the competence inside, uh, you always have an institution or a way to link to local academia or uh, university research or expertise locally that help the city to do the job. I think when it comes to data protection, actually usually cities are very well connected to data protection officers and there is expertise around the legal stuff. Now I think the challenging thing there is to link the legal part and the jurisprudential part with the with the technology and the and the encryption technologies and all the real technology that make sure that this is implemented right and all the processes. And so we are, for instance, now working on that. Uh, we have a project that uses, I mean, that looks at distributed data architecture, looking at blockchain, but also how to complement that with security and encryption and using attribute-based encryption when it's about um, dealing with personal data. And I think, I mean, Hopefully we're not the only one. I mean, we are really thinking about this kind of things right now and because we think this is very central to the, to, the, to the policies because everything is data intensive. So although you're not aware of it, you know, city run processes, you can call it smart city or you can call it some, something else. Digitalization is happening. I mean, we have laws, I don't know the case of um, Germany, we have a national law where digitalization is uh, basically you know, is rolling out at national level. The cities have to implement it. I mean, this means introducing e-payment system, digital IDs, uh, you know, making, making sure that everything is kind of getting digitalized. So at the core, you need to sort out your data strategy, making sure that you have the, the citizens' right at the very core of what you do. Otherwise, I mean, you're doing it worse than, um, yeah, 
than, than the companies. But I think the capability has to be built also in the institution because, I mean, the institution can guarantee that citizens' rights are respected. I mean, this doesn't happen. I mean, you, you may say there are big corporations have better engineers. Yes, that's true. But they have less incentive to keep the citizens' rights at the core of what they do because they monetize the data. So the institution can really you know, look at how do we build the citizen right at the core because we want to provide public services in, in return. So there, there is an incentive there to do, yeah. it, to do it well. And I, and I can add from a Berlin perspective, when, 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 whenever a new project in Berlin is introduced, like we are, we are, we are, we are currently, currently expecting a project where you, where you test automatic driving um, around the Brandenburg Gate or um, when we talk about an energy project which is called Windnode, that, that data and data security is always one of the biggest issues which is, which, is, which, is, which is checked um, while, 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 while looking at this, at this project. So this is, this is always, always an issue. And if I may add, I mean, this, this is not the only capability you may lack in government. For instance, I mean, we, have, we are also migrating, uh, uh, we have a migration towards open, so open source software in the city hall of Barcelona. Uh, because we think this is more effective, it's more efficient, it allows cities to reuse um, the applications they produce, reuse services, um, it avoids lock-in, it allows interoperability and all of that. And I mean, the thing is, they used to, you used to have better competence where the city were investing in this. So if the cities are investing in uh, free and open source software, they invest also in the capabilities to, to run these processes. If you externalize everything and you start using only proprietary system and you rely only on a few providers, then you lose your capability. So I think the entire digitalization strategies which should be about building this core capability inside and then work with the ecosystem to make sure that your providers are partner and they are not like you're not only, you know, contract-driven situation where the city is just in the hands of few providers. So it's really about changing this relationship with the providers and making sure the cities have the capability to run these kind of processes. And, you know, you don't depend on any provider in particular to run your services. So this is actually an organizational uh, issue, which is pretty complex, but uh, this is what I think digitalization is about. Thank you. Um, this really fits well, I think, um, because I, I just think that uh, smart cities, the, the whole approach is very business driven up to now. And um, if we have more democratic standards, I think that is really crucial. And um, is there a sort of best practice list we could exchange between Barcelona and Berlin? Because I think that would be really nice to have. Um, to push the criteria for public good, for public interest, and talking about data ownership, I think we really should talk uh, much more not only about public data by government uh, and, and um, what is Verwaltung administration, um, but also about data, traffic data, data of nature, and so on, so on, so that we do not um, privatize all these data, but have a new approach of how to share this data and how to govern this data. Um, in a whole, I think it's extremely interesting to, to have a new approach of smart cities that enables citizens to um, use the tools of the digital tools. For example, in Berlin, we just had uh, um, our data protection officer uh, said, well, uh, teachers are not allowed to use WhatsApp. But what is the other tool we use? You know, so so um, it's great to say this is against the law, but um, it would be better to have good tools. So if we have an exchange on this and say, here is a good practice, here are good tools, here is a good strategy for open innovation, open standards for the uh, government um, administration as well as other institutions which are relevant in respect to public interest, I think this is so important about the smart city approach. Thank you. Well, what, yeah. what, 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 what we can say due to, I'm currently a sponge and learning, learn, learning a lot. We, we have met before and we agreed on sit down afterwards to exchange such <laughs> lists. Yeah. 
Yeah, and um, I mean, just to add on that, I think um, this best practices is not just, you know, us exchanging. I mean, of course, we are planning to have this exchange, but I think that cer certain practice lead to much more of the creation of this capacity for collaboration. For instance, now that we are um, shifting to open source and we're starting to create a capacity in government, we also start publishing the, the code on GitHub and, you know, ask communities like this one to contribute. Because I'm, I'm a big believer that you cannot do this kind of participatory agenda if you don't have this kind of people here with the technical capacity and the innovation ideas to work with us. So we, we need to have the right infrastructure and the right tools for collaboration out there because so we can, yes, of course, target the citizen needs and work for citizens to address main problems and challenges, but also, you know, get the involvement of the community that you need in order to develop these tools because some of these tools are available, some of these tools have to be built, you know, and so you need, you need this uh, talent coming together and work with the city. Uh, to make this happen. And so, I mean, to be very aware of where, I, where I'm now working, which is city government, sometimes it's the problem is in the city government. You know, not always, but you know, it's like we don't have also the processes for being very collaborative in this way because it's, it's a kind of a closed um, structure when it comes to collaboration. So we need to experiment on the framework that made this collaboration possible because we do really need to work as a community to build these tools that are needed. Uh, yeah, the woman there. Yeah, we had quite a lot of men asking questions already. Um, you will get your... Sorry. Um, the lady from Barcelona, thank you for your um, presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you, what do you do if you... Or how do you stimulate existing governments or city councils to actually, you know, acti actively change and look outside for resources? Because you just um, explained, for example, that technology is actually driving um, policies these days. For example, Uber, they force us to rethink um, how we work. And how do you stimulate um, existing government councils and so on um, to actively, actively now change how you have been working in the past and acti actively look outside for contribution in your, in your city? Because I think that is really, they're so much behind. You know, they're driven by technology, but they haven't actually changed it and have not actively, actively done something to actually... Um, not all cities, but a lot of cities, because they're government departments and they're very, mm -hmm. you know, not very flexible, so say to say, to say the least. Mm -hmm. And you, I mean, you are inside of these, apparently, you make these policies. How do you stimulate your own government departments no, to change? I think, I, yeah, I think this is really critical. I think, um, I mean, you cannot do it without the public workers. And so we are really, I mean, a part of that kind of digitalization strategy is really focused on getting the public workers on board. And I always talk about, uh, we want to achieve, I mean, we have a grand vision, yes, because we want this democratic city, we want to get there where we change the relationship of power and all of this, but actually what we are really all irreversible changes, which means, you know, that you introduce small changes, so they won't look like um, this kind of big vision, but they're practical and they're small and very hard to undo. So I think this is what we're all working on, that it's not easy to do these things in government because they're not prepared. I think this is part of the democratic deficit that we have anyways, you know? I think when you ask me what do you do to stimulate the government, I mean, what citizens do to stimulate the government? This is the question, because, uh, you know, it will never change by itself, because, you know, it, you have to have a pressure to change things, and this pressure has to come from, you know, from, from, from the citizens. I do really think that. And then once you are inside, of course, um, you, you start with this um, question of, of culture, understanding the organizational problems, never only with the technology, because that's, I think, what we both are saying. The technology is never 
the, the most important thing is always the organizational processes, the culture, the mindset, the capabilities, and then, you know, the will. Of course, the will, the will has to be there, and that's political. But, but you, this, is, this is nice what you say, but the technology is pushing certain areas, for example, taxi drivers or creative people, and they already suffer from the changes. So they actually, you know, and the government departments, are, they don't recognize that yet in the, in the way they work and operate, you know, and, and therefore the technology is actually pushing the, the change. No, absolutely, but I, I think what we're saying is it is a problem where you have a technology-driven disruption that doesn't really match what, what, what people need. So you can have, you know, really interesting technologies which are uh, used by Uber or Airbnb, which is about platforms and how they operate and how you can use data. But of course, if you only use this to maximize the return of the company and then you don't take care of um, labor standards, you don't take care of what happens uh, to the citizens, you don't take care, you know, this is not an innovation which is sustainable in time. And that's why lots of people are pushing back. So I think it's about understanding technology and understanding how you can use it to enhance the public good. And this, this is all this conversation that we're having here. And I mean, already that we are talking about this and the conversation I can tell you is happening with many other cities. Maybe a question is why it is happening first with cities than with government? Because I can, I can see that sometimes the cities are the most dynamic one that are taking on lots of tasks and initiatives about what government don't do. And this is also true. I mean, with Barcelona, we are seeing this, for instance, in migration policy. I mean, the government has a, it's a terrible migration policy, and we've been standing forward, you know, to, to say welcome to the migrants and to give buildings of the city and to make, you know, sure that solidarity was there. We're doing that in providing basic services that the government doesn't provide anymore. I mean, we are dealing with real needs and real services that people need, and that's why I think there is a dynamism in cities that should be exploited and the technological conversation should be right at the core. And, some, and most, many times it's not there. And, and maybe, maybe, maybe to add this, I, 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 would dis I would disagree that this debate is not going on. This is, the, these issues are discussed and the pressure, and, and I would agree on this, especially on cities, is high. We are, we are growing, there's, a, there's under the microscope many, many things on, 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 on mobility, on housing, where we have to find an answer and how, how, to, how, to, how, to, how, to, how to play this into the administration means to have, have a stand on this and to, to have a clear answer on in which, in which way you want certain things because this is how I experience, I, I, I'm new in the administrative world, I'm, I'm learning now how to deal with the, with, with the administration and it helps. Um, to have a clear answer on, 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 on certain things. If you, if you say, I want to have things on a collaborative way, I'm, 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 I, 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 want to have, I want to have projects implemented in a way that, that we discuss about this and you can lift this. Um, it's, it is possible to change administrations as well and to foster this or, or to, and to push certain, certain, certain debates. Yeah, but it's a slow, uh, to change a culture and to change certain established process is a, is, a, is a very long way, I have, I have the feeling. So. I think one more question, because that wasn't the, the, the right last words, right? It's a yeah. long way now. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's have one more question from here, and then um, we're way. running out. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, not to be anonymous, uh, my name is Norbert Streitz, Smart Future Initiative from Frankfurt. And... Um, I would like to question the whole notion of smartness. And I think we should not have smartness as a goal, but we should have like a humane, sociable, cooperative city uh, for the citizens. And so I think we should go away with the term smart city. And that's also the um, talk of um, the title of my talk I'm giving tomorrow at 1.45 on stage five. Uh, <laughs> beyond smart cities towards humane, sociable, and cooperative uh, cities. And I'd like to introduce one issue here which hasn't been raised, and I'm pretty surprised here, because when you have a smart service being offered to the citizens, uh, there's always a trade-off between the type of data you're providing as a citizen and the type of smartness you get. And so I think we have to introduce much more the term privacy here, which I haven't heard from you. You just talked about data protection. 
but data protection is something different as privacy because privacy is where you decide what kind of data you're providing. And so I'm wondering what, especially like Berlin, uh, if you have any plans to make privacy by design as part of citizen-centered design a goal for your um, uh, efforts. And it could be also a USP for Berlin then or other cities also in Europe to say the services we are providing in our quote-unquote smart cities are privacy by design services. What do you think about this? Let me let me look. It can't be a USP if Frankfurt if Frankfurt is already is already doing this. Um, what we what, what we are going to do in the first step is actually to, to define open data first of all. Where we where we where we I agree. Sometimes we are talking about about privacy there, but actually to 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 answer the question first. How how to, how to move forward with 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 data in this in this in this city. Generally, it might be it might be that privacy is there is there an issue too? Can tell you now. Um, yeah, it's, I, it's a little bit disappointing, right? I mean, I have yeah, I, like actually something a bit. I, I think for me, what you just said is a bit controversial. I mean, this would open a totally different conversation. I think we have no time. Because I do think, I mean, of course, privacy and security by design should be embedded in the infrastructure and the way you design technology, I agree. And this is also part of the data protection regulation. I also think that the uh, notion of privacy itself should be expanded to understand the type of debate that we're having here because it's the individualistic notion of privacy, um, unfortunately, uh, doesn't... Um, I mean, doesn't enable us to limit some of the power, for instance, of the predatory platform that operate, you know, today. And this is because all this question of um, collective rights, you know, and that's why sometimes data protection work better because there is the fundamental right um, uh, approach which is there is because it recognizes also some kind of collective rights that enable us to think about the democratization of the economy as well, which is part of the conversation that we never have. Because, you know, the risk is that we talk about privacy and security, which will be offered as a service by the same corporations that are creating the problems that we need to, to fight. So, you know, by itself, it doesn't, it's not enough to prevent that we having this um, superpower of the predatory data-driven platforms. And we are seeing it now operating where the market will just uh, give um, a privacy and security solution if you're rich enough to afford it. While we think it should be fundamental right and that we have to understand some new collective rights that are there around data and so also rethink the ownership of it. For instance, in Barcelona, we talk about data as a common. But I think the, so the, the issue here no, is I think that we're, we're, okay. we're done with the time. I'm sorry, but we're not done with the discussion, of course, <laughs> uh, only this panel. Um, and, and we will, uh, and I think it has just only begun, uh, especially in Berlin. Um, and if you're interested in um, pushing uh, this discussion a bit more, if you're interested in this whole uh, debate, uh, please look up the new uh, draft transparency law that the Open Knowledge Foundation has published today, uh, which goes way beyond the scope of open data, but actually uh, open processes as well. And central documents that have to be published by uh, the city, uh, look it up at uh, Open Knowledge Foundation or berlin.transparenzgesetz.de and I want to thank very much our two discussants, Francesca and Christian for coming here and talking with us. Thank you.